Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to see everyone. It's been uh, enjoyable seeing everyone here over the course of the conference. Uh, audio going well? Yes? Okay. Let me check. Yes, no, shaky? Good. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, the title of my talk, uh, which I've actually no, uh -uh. yeah, it's a little. It's very muffled and there's a lot of crackling, so there's something not quite right. Something is amiss. My head is kind of big, so maybe this doesn't fit well. All right, is it? Oh, it might be my beard. Yeah, so maybe should I go with the handheld mic, maybe? Exactly. Yeah, it's a little too late to share. I feel like I'm a, like a, a defective robot. Okay. Uh, How many Pythonistas does it take to change a headset? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I have an uncooperative head. So. <laughs> okay. All right. How is that? Yeah. Audio good? All right. All right, fantastic. Let me keep going. So again, very happy to be here. Uh, I was happy to be invited for the first PyCon Africa. Uh, this is my first time in Africa, and as an African American, that is something that is important to many of us. So the talk, Code Joe Python, and you, uh, I was sort of asked to talk about my path and how I've come to where I am now and the things that I do in the Python community. So who am I? Who is Kojo? Uh, sort of the, the TLDR version is I'm someone who, and I'm sorry, TLDR, too long did not read. It's a, an abbreviation we use, I know in North America, maybe in other parts of the world. But I am someone who, I'm a Python developer now, but I started with a different career. I started uh, as an accountant. So I got a bachelor's degree in accounting, worked as an accountant, uh, decided I wanted to spend time teaching, and so I spent two years working on a PhD and realize that a PhD in accounting is nonsense. Don't ever do that if, if the option comes up. So yeah, don't do that. Um, went back and finished uh, an MBA, got my MBA, promptly ran off to China to teach in China, teach accounting in China for two years, accounting in MIS. Then came back to the US from China and worked more as an accountant. But in, in, in that entire time, I had had an interest in computers my entire life and in programming. And after I came back from China, I decided to be, become more serious about learning enough programming to make a career switch. So then I went through that process, uh, started speaking at conferences and presenting at conferences before I was a developer, got a development job, and then became an organizer for uh, DjangoCon US, which is the North American Conference for Django. And through that, ended up creating and taking on this North American ambassador role and speaking at different conferences and talking to people about DjangoCon US coming to their city. So that's sort of my history, uh, professional history in a nutshell. As far as some of my personal interests, I'm into all sorts of unusual stuff that one might not expect. So for instance, uh, K-pop, uh, Korean pop music. Is that popular here in Africa? Yes, no, yes. Some people are like yes, but so uh, K-pop is a thing I'm into. Uh, tiny houses also a thing that I'm interested in. My friends find this hilarious that I'm generally the biggest person that they know. Uh, I'm, I'm 195 centimeters tall, and, but they're like, wait, why is Kojo the big person into tiny houses? What, what's that all about? Um, think of the side effect of having lived in Asia. Uh, and then also the video game Overwatch is something that I'm a fan of. So the shirt that I'm wearing actually is a jersey from the Overwatch League. It's a competitive esports league where they play Overwatch. This is actually the jersey for the Washington Justice, which is my hometown team. I live in Houston, Texas, but I'm originally from Washington, D.C., and the, the jersey has a little more significance to come up later in the talk, so we'll see that later. So that's me. What do I do? Uh, again, DjangoCon U.S. organizer, and I do some, I'm working on doing some DevRel stuff for DjangoCon U.S. I am, as pointed out before, the DEF North American ambassador, and so as I've traveled around to the North American continent, talking to people about Django Khan, I refer to it as NORAM GT, the North American Grand Tour. And so you might see that hashtag on Twitter sometimes. It's something that I use as I travel. Uh-oh, I'm getting feedback. 
Yeah, no. So I use that in, again, that role has sort of morphed. The original goal was for me to be the North American, the, the ambassador from DEFNA to North America. It has now sort of changed because clearly I am, this is not North America, this is Africa. Uh, I spoke last year at PyCon Australia, also not North America. So I seem to have become the North American ambassador to the rest of the world. So that's a thing. Uh, what I try to focus on as far as my community activity is trying to add new contributors to the Python and Django communities. It's where I feel I can sort of uh, do, the most, do the most good and, and make the most contribution. And as a result of that, I was awarded the 2018 Malcolm Trednick Memorial Prize by the Django Software Foundation. Uh, it's something that I'm fairly proud of. I believe I am the second African to win that award. Uh, Aisha Bello. Okay, thank you. So I won the award in 2018, but Aisha Bello from Nigeria, who has been active in many, many Python things, won the, the same award in 2016. So uh, I am happy to be in that company. All right, so now let's move on to one of the big questions that I get really all the time in America and has happened a lot since I got here to Ghana. People see me and they think, they're my, my name, like, Ko Kojo? You're, you're a Kojo? But it's like, we see this name, we recognize this name, it's one of our names, but you don't, you don't look like a Kojo. What's, what's going on? Um, you're, or is it Kujo or Quadwo or, or what have you? So this causes a lot of confusion. Um, in North America, it, there's confusion because no one has heard of Kojo for the most part. Here, there's confusion because everyone has heard of Kojo, even knows of Kojo, but I, I don't seem to match. And so there's always such confusion. I'd like to think of myself as the North American Kojo, uh, but the reality is I'm not the North American, I'm a North American Kojo. I'm actually, I have this name because I am named for the person I consider to be the North American Kojo. And so that person, the, the, the most common spelling of their name is, is this spelling. So if you look that person up on Wikipedia, that's who you'll find. And so this, this Kojo slash Kujo um, is a person who is believed to be of, uh, of a con descent who was born free in Jamaica to a group of formerly enslaved Jamaicans that rebelled, and he led a rebellion of those who were called the Maroons. He led a rebellion of those people against the British. And so in 1739, the British were forced to sign a non-aggression pact with him uh, because they couldn't take him over. So as the Ghanaians and many others here know, Kojo was an Akande name for people who were born on Monday uh, I was born on Sunday, so I should be Kwesi. But this coach was born on Monday, but his name in North America took on the meaning of unconquerable because the British couldn't conquer him. And so I think it's interesting sort of for myself and in a group of Ghanaians that in 1739, and let me read, read this quote. In 1739, uh, Kojo reached an agreement with the British that recognized the Leeward Maroons as an independent nation. So in 1739, the real North American Kojo achieved independence for the British. This was about 40 years before my country, the United States, achieved independence from the British, and about 220 years before Ghana achieved independence from the British. So the real Kojo, making things happen since 1739, I am named for that Kojo. So I am a, I'm the, the lesser Kojo of North America. Um, but it's a good name nonetheless. So how and why Python? Uh, as, as I said, I've changed careers. Partially due to a personal interest, um, I had an interest in building things and making new things, and also in looking forward. In my accounting career, a lot of the energy was put into looking back, looking at what had happened in the past, and in sort of recording results of things that had already happened. I was more interested in looking forward and building new things and being able to plan for the future. But I also made the career change because I felt it would give me prospects for a better life. Um, better income potential as a programmer, um, more location flexibility. It's much more common to be able to work remotely as a software developer than it is as an accountant, um, things of that nature. And so this idea of a better life, how and why is that important? In my case, it's important to me because this is what, what my, my parents wanted. And I've got parents here in quotations because I'm talking about not my biological parents, but my actual parents, the people who raised me. So my my normal parents, my biological parents got divorced when I was two, and so I was raised by my mother and her mother, my grandmother, and so those are my parents, those are the people who raised me. <clears throat> if you've had interactions with me in the time that I've been here, or if you have heard things about me or seen things about me, 
and they had been positive things, that's my mother and my grandmother. So all of the good things about me come from them. If you've seen me and, or, and things have gone wrong, that's me. That's Kojo. That's the, that's the, and not even like fancy North American Kojo, that's the lesser North American Kojo. Um, so, but all the good things about me come from my mother and my grandmother. Those are the people who were raised me. That's where all my powers and abilities come from. Um, but one of the key things about my family is that my grandmother was born in a small town in South Carolina. She didn't get a chance to go to high school. And so for her, education was always very important. And so one of her biggest points of pride, and that's one of my biggest points of pride, is that not only did all of her children go to high school, not only did, not only did all of her children finish high school, but they all did some sort of formal education after high school. And so in my family, this is an important thing. It was important to my grandmother. It's important in the generation before me. It's important in my generation as well. So my mother went on to get a bachelor's degree and also get a master's degree in education and worked as a teacher. Uh, so the idea of education was always very important in our family. I ended up starting high school at what we called an engineering magnet program, so something focused on what nowadays would be called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. So I started high school there when I was 14 doing that. Unfortunately, just about the same time, uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. So by the time I was 15 and a half, she was gone. And so at this point, this is sort of, in that time, those first two years of high school is sort of when my grandmother, you know, sort of becomes my other parent. She, I mean, she's always been, she was the queen of our family, she was our matriarch. But I spent my first two years of high school either living with her because my mother was in the hospital, in and out of the hospital, or living by myself for probably most of my second year of high school. Um, my father and I, I ended up living with him later in high school just because of odd circumstances, but he wasn't the, really the person that raised me. And so my mother's gone, I go into college, I major in business, uh, and, but still there's this idea of wanting to have a better life and wanting each generation to do better than the one who did before it. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that was so important to my grandmother was because of her experiences as an African person in America. And so for that, we need to talk about the idea of like home and what does home mean. So here we have a couple of images. On the right, we see the outline of the state of Texas, which is where I live now. And it's, it's still sort of funny to me. If you go to Texas, this shape is like everywhere. It's like people in Texas are gonna forget that they're from Texas. And so like everything is like, Texas, Texas, like on the trucks, it's Texas Ford and you, Pepsi, the soda is known as today's Texas taste. It's like, oh, by the way, Texas, did you know you were in Texas? Hi, Texas, how about some more Texas? Would you like some Texas on that? It's just, it's everywhere. Um, so that's something I, I just always, I just see it all the time, I'm used to it now. On the left, what you see is an outline of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, and my hometown. And so to me it's important because, again, Going back to my family, it's where I was born, it's where my mother was born. It's not where my grandmother was born, but it's where she raised all of her children. My grandmother had nine children. Eight of the nine were born in D.C., and the oldest, my mother was the second oldest, the oldest was not born in D.C., but she, they moved there when she was like four or five. So this is literally my ancestral home. Um, this is you know, where the ancestors that I know personally, this is where you know, they grew up and, and, and built their lives. And so if we take a look uh, in this, well, it works out sort of well here. So this is another outline of Washington, D.C. In the bottom, I think it's the bottom right corner from your perspective, the bottom right corner, the big word there, Anacostia, that's southeast Washington, D.C. The city is divided into four quadrants, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. Anacostia is a neighborhood that my family is from. And so I'll, be, I'll go home at the end of September for uh, just because of some events. But that's where I'll go, I'll go to Anacostia. So that's home, my mother graduated from Anacostia High School. So this is home. Um, I love my home, I'm proud to be from my home. One of the reasons I wore this jersey is because it represents my home city. And here, the, the logo is the shape of my hometown. I'm always pleased to see it. I am, because as I think you all know, home is home. And there's always a special place in your heart for home. At the same time, as an African American, in, in America, I can't help but be reminded that this is also, that home is also the capital of the country that enslaved my ancestors. And 
as a result has created all sorts of negative systems for people of African descent. So as much as I love my home and I love my family that's there, I also recognize that my home doesn't really love me back in a lot of ways. So let's talk about African people. Um, here we talk about, um, I'll talk about the actor Jaiman Hansu. We are all familiar with him, yes? So Jaiman Hansu, if you sort of look up information on him, um, I, I didn't include a picture of him next to me because that's just a bad comparison for me. So uh, he is a Beninese American because he is from Benin, formerly, I think it was Dame when he was born, but he is a Beninese American because he is from that country, he is from that culture, he has a connection to it. I am African American because I don't know where in Africa I'm from. And this is the nature of most African Americans. Somewhere on the continent, probably you know, south of Senegal, the Gambia, and probably north of Cameroon, but somewhere, probably West Africa. And even though there's a, like, some sort of genetics test that I could take that would give me some idea as to what, what particular ethnic group I might have come from, I still won't have a direct connection to that culture. I wouldn't have been raised in those cultural tradi traditions. So this is the nature of uh, African American people. And there's, there's one reason for this. And so I've been working on this talk for quite some time. And as I was preparing the slides and preparing topics, I thought to myself, Kojo, do you really just want to go to Africa and talk about white supremacy? Is that really like, it's, it's, a, it's Pi Con Africa, Kojo. Like, I mean, do you really want to talk about white supremacy? And so I went back and forth on it. But then some things happened. Um, I left my apartment in Houston on Saturday, August 3rd at about 11.30 Houston time. Uh, Houston on the east side of the state. At 11.39 in El Paso, Texas on the west side of the state, a white supremacist went to a Walmart and shot 46 people. Uh, 22 of them killed, 24 of them injured. And so, you know, the idea of, of white supremacy is like, it's not just some sort of weird pie in the sky thing. And in the US right now, there's a lot of political debate. Some people will say that our president has fostered this sort of thing. The reality is these white supremacist ideas have been in the United States since its inception. And that's just the nature of, of my country. Uh, what, no matter how I feel about it, that's just the reality. So literally right after I leave my apartment to come to Africa for the first time, a white supremacist, on the, he, drove a, he drove a thousand kilometers to do this. So like driving from, from Lagos to Abidjan, just to, to shoot up people, or from, from Lagos to Douala. And it's like, okay, I hate these people that much. I'm, just, I'm gonna drive that far to shoot people. Um, so that happens just before I get on the plane. Then when I arrive in Ghana, I arrive on August 4th, which is the, the first time that the new Founders Day here is being celebrated. The Founders Day here, that, uh, the new Founders Day, the former, the, I guess the original Founders Day, September 21st, uh, Kwame Nkrumah's birthday. Now there's a new Founders Day, August 4th, for all the founders of Ghana. And now Kwame Nkrumah's birthday is Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. I'm watching the news here, and the Ghanaian president is talking about how Ghana needs to get rid of the old arrangements. It needs to move forward and get rid of the old arrangements that have benefited the former colonial powers. So just before I get on the plane to leave my country, to come to Africa, white supremacists attack. I get off the plane in Ghana, the Ghanaian president is talking about white supremacy and how that needs to be overcome. So I sort of felt like I needed to talk about white supremacy because it sort of bookended my trip here. Um, interestingly enough, this is a screenshot from Wikipedia of Founders Day in Ghana. Wikipedia can't keep up with Africa, so it's still showing Founders Day as September 21st, but that has changed just recently. So when we look at African people dealing with white supremacy, African people in Africa have to deal with white supremacy. African people in America are dealing with it. Uh, I'm here to speak to my cousins, my cousins in Africa, because this is something that we have all had to face. So my ancestors were taken from Africa and taken across an ocean, disconnected from our culture um, due to white supremacy. And in my country, systems of institutionalized racism have been built that continue to affect the African people in that country to this day. Here in Africa, my cousin's ancestors weren't taken, but they were colonized in their own homes and had white supremacy inflicted upon them in their own homes. But it, white supremacy remains white supremacy, uh, and it continues to have negative effects on African people. So I'm African-American. What does that mean? What, 
what is African American, uh, how do those things interact. So as an African person, as African people, my ancestors who didn't have access to their own home culture, the only culture that my ancestors had access to was the culture that they were surrounded by. And that was the culture that clearly devalued them, that, that hated them because it enslaved them, it, it supported their enslavement. Uh, there's a joke by a comedian uh, who's now since passed away named George Carlin, a white comedian, and his joke was that America was founded by slave owners who wanted freedom. So, you know, there were people who, while owning slaves, felt that the king of England wasn't, like, being fair to them or giving them their freedom. So that's, it's my country, yay, America. Um, it's just sort of the reality. And so there's this sort of weird duality of being African and American, and I've said this to some people while I've been here. In America, we tend to think that we are the center of the universe and that we invented everything and that everything started with us. Um, if you speak to a lot of African Americans, we sometimes tend to think, it was some of us, some, sometimes tend to think that like, we are literally the black people. Like if someone's talking about black people, they must mean us. And, you know, it's like, and that people from Africa are, well, they're different, they're Africans. Uh, no, you know, we're called African American for a reason. Um, but there's this strange dichotomy of being African American and that we have a lot of that sort of bravado and self-confidence that comes from being American because we, you know, that's the only culture we know so we sort of feel like we can do everything and, and anything. But at the same time, we have these self-destructive behaviors because we grow up in a culture that hates us and that tells us that we're not supposed to survive and that we're not supposed to advance. But the reality is you can't stop African people. We just sort of keep it moving. So in America specifically, African Americans gave America most of its modern music and many other aspects of American culture. And that American culture has sort of spread around the world, but it is heavily influenced by the African people who were there. Uh, some of us, including W.E.B. Du Bois, joined with our continental cousins here in the, in the Pan-African movement, recognizing that African people of different nations can benefit by working together uh, in common. Um, but it's always been an uphill battle for African Americans because the only culture that we know that we readily have access to is one that hates us and that devalues us. So we're the citizens of the, the richest and most powerful nation in the world, but it's a country that doesn't really want us and doesn't really care for us. So Du Bois coined this term double consciousness, which is this idea of being sort of African and American and sort of having these warring factions in your mind because you have all the American confidence and you, you, you think you're around these resources, but at the same time you know that the country doesn't really care for you. Uh, and for my African American sisters, it is sometimes known as a triple consciousness because there is the, the patriarchy that women have to deal with and so there's, there's the institutionalized sexism that African American women have to deal with along with the racism. So, um, realizing the promises that America has to offer are much harder than it would seem. So you're surrounded by wealth and riches. It's, it's the richest country in the world. We're surrounded by all these resources. Uh, but it's very difficult to actually make true on those promises. But it's not impossible. And so what I said earlier about my ancestors, uh, my mother and my grandmother, and me being the best person, that's not hyperbole. That's just the literal truth. Um, each of them wanted the generation that came after them to have a better life. And so despite the fact that my national culture is one that wants me to, to self-destruct, my mother and my grandmother built a foundation that I could, I and my cousins, everyone in my generation sort of could move forward on so that we could have success. So all the things that I've been able to do, um, going to college, getting a bachelor's degree, getting a graduate degree, teaching in different countries, blah, 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 that's all happened because my literal direct ancestors paved the way for that. And not in a, you often hear people talk about their ancestors in this sort of, in a very, I'll, I'll say in a very Black Panther way. Like, you know, like your, your ancestors from a thousand years ago and the spirits of whomever, no. Like my mother and my grandmother, the people like literally a step and two steps behind me, you know, were paving this road and pushing me and moving me forward. And so, uh, and, and so when I was invited here to speak, one of the things that I pointed out was that I, on behalf of my ancestors, was very pleased to accept the invitation because that's who, that's who made me, that's who gave me my powers and abilities. The reality, however, is that lots of African
African Americans in my generation and generations even younger than me don't have that advantage. They didn't have two generations behind them who had the singular focus of your life is going to be better than mine and then you should make the life of the people after you better than mine. So there are lots of people that I know who are in my age range and younger who don't have those two generations behind them uh, building that support. So <clears throat> there's good news. After all the sort of doom and gloom, it's not all, it's not all bad news. Uh, the reality is that double consciousness can often be a strength, and that's something that Du Bois has noted, the idea that you know, African Americans can be both African and American and try to embrace the best aspects of both of these identities. And I have heard different narratives. So some of you may be aware of it, some of you may not be. There, there have been at times points of contention among continental Africans and African Americans uh, with regard to how we get along with each other or how we sometimes don't. One narrative is that African Americans are people whose ancestors got enslaved and so we must be like the bad ones or the weaker ones or you know, the ones who, who couldn't make it or whatever. Um, another way to look at that is that I am descended from people who survived more than 200 years of, of forcible enslavement and then another 100 plus years of you know, legal, legalized racial apartheid. And so, yes, my ancestors were enslaved, but they survived it, and my direct ancestors survived it, and we're here now, we're still here. So, and then the, rea the reality is that I was raised by two women who lived in much more difficult times than I did. And again, as I pointed out with the idea of triple consciousness, my mother and my grandmother, both women, had to deal with the institutionalized sexism along with the racism uh, and in times when it was much more difficult. So uh, that is here. More good news is that I'm, this is a, a phrase you will hear sometimes in American commercials. Um, you know, a, a store is having something on sale. Like, we found something on sale and we're passing the savings on to you. And so I have been through these difficult things and I'm sort of passing the savings along to you all. The reality is that some of the struggles that I've gone through and some of the difficulties I've had have given me a large amount of empathy and ability to understand the feelings and perspectives of, of other people. And it allows me to see some of the advantages that I have and the privileges that I've had uh, in certain situations where other people might not have those privileges and advantages. And so it's given me an, an, an ability to see these things and also a desire to be helpful. So now, how does this all come back to Python? And so I know some folks might have been a little bit worried. It's like, okay, hold on, Koja. This is not like the Pan-African Revolution Conference. This is, you know, we, we came to learn about computer stuff, Koja. So, although actually the Pan-African Revolution Conference might be happening down the road. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, but the empathy that I have has driven me to do many of the things that I do in the Python and the Django communities uh, to make an effort to help people who have been overlooked or underestimated. So the work that I do to try to help bring new contributors into the community is based around that empathy. At DjangoCon US, I created the orientation session that we have to help people get acclimated and, and get comfortable when they first arrive at the conference. That comes from that empathy. I am the Lightning Talk Chair for DjangoCon US. I do that because I feel that if people are trying to get started speaking, a Lightning Talk is a great way to do that, so I try to create an environment that fosters that. Um, I'm also the Sprint Chair, the Development Sprint Chair for DjangoCon US. And I've taken that on because I feel that if people are trying to get started in making contributions to open source, I want to try to create the best environment for that so that people can, can get started on that in the best way. Uh, and I also took on the role of being the definite North American master. I created the role and took it on because DjangoCon US and a lot of software development can be very US-centric. But in North America, there's Canada, there's Mexico, there's the Caribbean, where there are lots of African people in the Caribbean. And I wanted to make sure that those people were included in the process as well. So I've spoken to Pi Caribbean and spoken to people there about things, uh, about you know, being more involved with the continental community. All right, and so again, focusing on Python and how that sort of empathy and how these things can be beneficial to software developers here in Africa. Again, when I talk about white supremacy and the impact that it has on African people, it's not just African Americans. It has also impacted my cousins here on the continent. And as a result, uh, many of my cousins here have similar types of empathy, an ability to understand that people aren't always treated well, things don't always go the way that you would expect, and you have to push through these challenges. 
So although it's not often talked about, increased empathy makes for better software engineers. If you're building software, again, as a software engineer, you're probably building software for someone else to use. You're not the one using it. And so an ability to understand those other people, your target market, is very useful for a software engineer. There's also the idea that global automation is a very real trend that's happening. Uh, this person in El Paso who shot all those people, one of his points of rhetoric was the idea that foreigners were coming and you know, taking jobs. That's not a real thing in the United States. Uh, what's actually happening in, in taking jobs are robots, in automation. Um, and so he, he didn't go shoot like a bunch of robots, or he didn't go to like a, an electronic store and shoot up a bunch of flat screen TVs. Um, so, but robots are, in automation, are some of the things that, that are reducing jobs. But all that code needs to be written by somebody. So, cousins, it could be you. Um, but also, don't forget about other, op other automation opportunities, not just globally, but also here locally. What are opportunities to create software to make life better for people here on the continent, here in your home countries. Um, there are lots of, you know, from things that might not be as glamorous as robots to like point of sale systems, or, you know, we've seen talks here about payment systems and payment processing and all, all sorts of other things. So there are lots of ways that automation can benefit people here on the continent, but having some empathy for the people who might benefit from these software solutions is very valuable. And so you can, you can write code with compassion. One concern about automation is that it just puts people out of jobs. Uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Sometimes automation can free people from certain jobs so they can contribute to society in other ways. And so that's something to keep in mind. And so why am I here? Uh-oh, my watch is, my watch is not cooperating with me. There we go. So wh why, am I, why am I here? Um, primarily I'm here because my cousins invited me to come home. And so, thank you. And so, I was very pleased to be invited to become home by my cousins. And, and I think as I've had the conversations with Marlene, and you know, I was going to do whatever was necessary to make sure that I made it here uh, to come and, and speak to my cousins and hope that I had something useful to say. Because again, I was not going to embarrass my ancestors. I was not going to, you know, just shame my mother and my grandmother. Um, I was going to you know, do what I could to not only be here, but to, to be of some benefit to my cousins here on the continent. And so just let me say this very clearly. Your cousins are here. Your North American cousins, we are here. We are working hard. We are working to advance ourselves. But we also see you. And we see that you all are here at home doing the same thing. And I cannot guarantee you that if you go to North America or that every African American that you meet is going to embrace you in the same fashion, but there are enough of us who will, such that you know, we see you and we see you working and we see you hustling the way we hustle, and that's the thing that we can do together. So that is part of the message I bring to you from North America. Uh, also, this is something that and again, things changed just before I was making my trip or right after I made my trip. Uh, this is something, for lack of a better term, I, I suppose you know, God works in mysterious ways. So has anyone heard of the year of return? Yes. I, I did not know about this until I got to Ghana. Uh, and so apparently, literally like, what is it, a... Uh, a 15 minute drive from here, uh, what is it, ANC Mall? Does anyone know where ANC Mall is? Yeah, so ANC Mall, next to ANC Mall, so I've provided a map in case you want to go later. Um, the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa, and, and let me just read this quote here, the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa is having their summit from August 5th to 11th, so it's happening now. And, and I'll quote, the 2019 uh, uh, HACSA summit will examine the 400 year legacy of the transatlantic slave trade through which Africans were enslaved with an aim to link, reunite, and reconcile the affected communities and share examples of innovation and creative strategies to overcome that episode's persisting negative effects. The summit also coincides with Ghana's Year of Return program, which symbolically marks the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans in the US and invites the African diaspora back home. So 
I didn't know this was happening, but it, it's, it's happening down the street, so. So I'm here to say I am home, cousins. I am, I am here in Midase for inviting me. I am I'm glad to be here. Uh, yeah, this, and, and again, when I saw this, I was like, oh, it's like literally like down the street from where, where we're having uh, Pike on Africa, so that's interesting. When I found this story, there was an interesting quote. I found it because there was an interesting quote. So the, uh, the vice president of Liberia is one of the people. So there are a number of very fancy you know, dignitaries and, and people like that there. The vice president of Liberia had this quote. Accra has become the America of, it's, sort of it's, it's the New York or the America of Africa. So the quote is, Accra has become the America of most of us. So instead of going to New York and California, most people come to Accra. And so right now we're having some problems in America. And so like, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how exactly to feel about that. It's like, is it good that Accra is the America of Africa? Or you know, should my cousins aspire to better maybe? But, but I, I sort of understand what she's saying. So I think in general it's positive. But I, I just remember thinking, well, that's an interesting quote. Um, so Accra has become the America. Of, of Africa or the New York of Africa. Okay, um, so that's, that was interesting. Um, so that's all that I have prepared. Um, if you want to reach out to me and get in touch with me, uh, for those of you who use Twitter, I am Transition on Twitter. Um, my website is just myname.com and uh, it, I, it's a blog that I don't update as much as I need to, but I am working on that. Again, your cousins continue to hustle. And the slides are going to be here at this GitHub repo. And that's all I have prepared. So thank you very much for your time. That was so, so good, Kojo. Like, that was super powerful. And um, so we are going to do some time for questions. I'm just okay. going to just rant a little. <laughs> Not rant too long. But I just want to say that that was really powerful. And I think having this at on the year of return and uh, having this as a Pan-African event, we are really honored to have you come. And it's so amazing to learn from you as an African who is living in America, from Felipe, who is an African in Brazil, you know, there you are. I'm like, <laughs> oh no, you've moved here. There you are. Uh, so for me, it's, it's so powerful to see that Africans are able to unite and come together uh, you know, from across the world with Python, I guess, bringing us together. So thank you again, Kojo. Thank you. Um, we do have time for some questions. So going to do like two questions really quick yeah. before we move on to lightning talks. Yeah. Let me also say as the, uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but as someone who is a lightning talk chair for another conference, I definitely don't want to run into the lightning talk time. I, I feel like that would be a terrible right. thing to do. So. <laughs> But I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we're going to just do probably one or two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, you really um, spoke to, to most of us. Um, here's my question. Many Africans here, they try to take that dangerous route back to the States. Um, and they try to do all sorts of things to, to, because they believe when they leave the shores of Africa, and they go back to um, the Americas or wherever, it's going to, they are going to have a better life. Mm. That is in stark contrast to our ancestors mm. who were forced over there and now exactly. we're... So what do you say to young people who think that the only way of survival is to be in the United States of America? Why, what do you think about them staying home and making this place a better place for our cousins to come back? Ah. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I like that question. So <clears throat> I would say on the one hand, I mean, there's definite value in improving your home. And, I, and I've had this conversation with a few people while I've been here. There is the idea that you know, I don't really have a home. You know, I mean, there's like, there's, you know, there's where my, my family lives and, and, and they love me, but I know that my, my home country doesn't. And so the fact that you have a home country here you know, Ghana or Namibia or, or whichever African country you're from, um, do what you can to try to make improvements there. If you decide you want to go to the United States to, for certain improvements, it is true that it is the richest country in the world and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. Um, you just have to be prepared you know, for the white supremacy that you will encounter. It's a little bit different for 
continental Africans going to the U.S. because, for lack of a better term, okay, so and I've said this before, I'll say it again. Americans, as a group, not very smart. Uh, so that's just sort of how that goes. Uh, we do and say dumb things. So oftentimes, in, in America, I'm considered black, but like Marlene wouldn't be, she, because black means people descended from slaves. Marlene's African. She's foreign. She's from a different country. And so it, it's slightly different. And so sometimes when Africans, continental Africans, come to America, there are certain, they're sometimes treated slightly better than African Americans because you are, you know, you're coming from another country. But then there's also the fact that as an African coming to America, there, you have the advantages that an immigrant has. Immigrants move from one country to another purposefully, decisively, with their own culture intact and with the plan of building a better life. And so that can lead to more success than what my ancestors had because we, the only culture we had access to was one that hated us. So I would say, sort of to your larger question, I don't know that you need to go to America to build a better life, but there are definitely opportunities to go there, be exposed to more things, and then bring those things back. Right now, America's immigration policy is, is really stupid where if you come to America and come to an American university and get a degree from an American university, you come, you get like an engineering degree or a math degree or something, you learn all this fancy science stuff, we don't let you stay. Like, I mean, you can, it's like, okay, well, you have to go back to Africa now. It's like, well, wait, like you graduated from MIT or Stanford or one of our fancy universities. I need you to get your fancy on right here in my country. How about that? But no, we're like, no, oh, no, no, now you have to go back to your country. So I, I personally think that's dumb. Um, but uh, again, so if that's what you decide that you want to do, be, pur be purposeful about it and, and have a plan to learn what you can, as we say, get your hustle on, and then bring that back home to improve, improve your home. So. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, is about, so the picture that uh, I personally have about uh, most of the black people in America is sort of the pursuit towards entertainment mm -hmm. more than, say, programming. Mm -hmm. uh, as a leader in uh, the communities of programming in North America, sort of what, if you can give me, if you can paint a small picture of the numbers, how many black people sort of uh, within these Python communities or other development uh. communities, yeah. Okay, so I, I don't have actual numbers, but I can tell you anecdotally that, okay, this, this, again, it's, uh, it's, it's real talk with my cousin's time. Uh, one of the reasons that I am so well known in the Python and Django communities in North America is because those communities are so predominantly white, and I am not. Um, and there's also the fact that I'm at 195 centimeters tall, I'm big and noticeable almost anywhere on earth. Um, but again, like the reality that those communities tend to be predominantly white. Um, now, there's also the fact that a lot of the things that I do are very forward-facing, so interacting with people. But there's, there's also this double consciousness issue where if you behave in certain ways as an African-American, some other African-Americans will accuse you of acting white. And so it is stigmatized um, within the community. And so there is not, there's not always support from the people around you to pursue some of these uh, technical pursuits. That is changing, but historically that has been the issue. So I, I don't have like numbers per se, um, but I know that they are small. Um, and so I know we're running out of time. I'm, I'm sorry your cousin is verbose, but again, I can, you can find me on the internet if, later. Uh, we are going to take a things. couple more questions and just like yeah, extend yeah, no. because yeah. it was really good. Okay. Uh, if anyone has any questions that are really like, or Kojo. I'll try to be more concise with my answers. Um, Kojo, actually, I, I mm -hmm. would like to know, um, what will you be able to take back from PyCon Africa to the North American community? Uh, so I know what I will take back personally is, and I'll avoid any adult language here, but to get my hustle on because I know like my cousins are here working and you know I'm not going to come back here next year and not be on top of my game you know so if I come back here next year I need to have new things to show my cousins so so that's that's one thing that I'll personally take back uh, I think in a larger sense the idea that just sort of 
being exposed to the range of things that people are doing here on the, here on the continent um, and letting people in North America know that, hey, you know, there, are, there are opportunities here uh, to partner with my cousins. Because I'm, and I'll just be direct, I'm, I'm not here to support colonization of my cousins. You know, don't, don't, don't go to my cousin's home and try to colonize my cousins because you might have to see me about that. I, you know, you, we'll have problems. But there are definitely opportunities for you to partner with my cousins because they have skills and abilities uh, that some of the resources, the infrastructure, things of that nature on the continent might not be where they need to be, but my cousins here on the continent definitely have skills and abilities, and you can partner with them in, in a way that can benefit both parties. So I think those would be the, the two main takeaways. Thank you so much, Kojo. That was such a powerful <laughs> closing keynote, super appropriate. Uh, to close off the